Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. This time we dive back into one of the Alfred Hitchcock books I have on my shelves titled My Favorites in Suspense. The story is from Carter Dixon, entitled New Murders for Old, which is a great macabre mystery. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Hargraves did not speak until he had turned on two lamps. Even then, he did not remove his overcoat. The room, though cold, was stuffy and held a faintly sweet odor. Outside the Venetian blinds, which were not quite closed, you saw the restless, shifting presence of snow past streetlights. For the first time, Hargraves hesitated. The, the object, he explained, indicating the bed, was there. He came in by this door here. P perhaps you understand a little better now? Hargraves' companion nodded. No, said Hargraves and smiled. I'm not trying to invoke illusions. On the contrary, I'm trying to dispel them. Shall we go downstairs? It was a tall, heavy house where no clocks ticked, but the treads of the stairs creaked and cracked sharply, even under their padding of carpet. At the back, in a kind of small study, a gas fire had been lighted. Its hissing could be heard from a distance. It roared up blue, like solid blue flames, into the white fretwork of the heater, but it did little to dispel the chill of the room. Hargraves motioned his companion to a chair at the other side of the fire. "'I want to tell you about it,' he went on. "'Don't think I'm trying to be—' His wrist hesitated over a word, as though over a chess piece. "'Highbrow. Don't think I'm trying to be highbrow if I tell it to you.' Again his wrist hesitated. Uh, "'Objectively. As though you knew nothing about it. As though you weren't concerned in it.' It's the only way you'll understand the problem he had to face. Hargraves was very intent when he said this. He was bending forward, looking up from under his eyebrows, his heavy overcoat flopped over the sides of his knees, and his gloved hands, seldom still, either made a slight gesture or pressed flat on his knees. Take Tony Marvel to begin with, he argued, a good fellow whom everybody liked, not a good businessman, perhaps, too generous to be a good businessman, but as conscientious as the very devil, and with so fine a mathematical brain that he got over the practical difficulties. Tony was senior wrangler at Cambridge and intended to go on with his mathematics. But then his uncle died, so he had to take over the business. You know what the business was then? Three luxury hotels built, equipped, and run by old Jim, the uncle in old Jim's most flamboyant style all going to rack and ruin. Everybody said it was madness for Tony to push his shoulder up against the business world. His brother, that's Stephen Marvel, the former surgeon, said Tony would only bring old Jim's card houses down on everybody and swamp them all with more debts. But you know what happened. At 25, Tony took over the business. At 27, he had the hotels on a paying basis. At 30, they were hotels to which everybody went as a matter of course, blazing their sky signs, humming with efficiency, piling up profits which startled even Tony. And all because he sneered at the idea that there could be any such thing as overwork. 
he never let up. You can imagine that dogged expression of his, well, I don't like this work, but let's clean it up satisfactorily so that we can get on to more important things, like his studies. He did it partly because he'd promised old Jimmy would, and partly because, you see, he thought the business so unimportant that he wanted to show how easy it was. But it wasn't easy. No man could stand to that pace. London, Brighton, Eastbourne, he knew everything there was to know about the Marvel hotels, down to the price of a pillowcase and the cost of grease for the lifts. At the end of the fifth year, he collapsed one morning in his office. His brother Stephen told him what he had to do. "'You're getting out of this,' Stephen said. "'You're going clear away, round the world, anywhere, but for six or eight months at the shortest time. During that time, you're not even so much as to think of your work. Is that clear?' Tony told me the story himself last night. He says that the whole thing might have never have happened if he'd not been forbidden to write to anybody while he was away. Not even so much as a postcard, snapped Stephen, to anybody. If you do, it'll be more business and then God help you. But Judith, Tony protested, particularly to Judith, said Stephen, if you insist on marrying your secretary, that's your affair, but you don't ruin your rest cure by exchanging long letters about the hotels. You can imagine Stephen's over-aristocratic, thin-nosed face towering over him, dull with anger. You can imagine Stephen, in his black coat and striped trousers, standing up beside the polished desk of his office in Harley Street. Stephen Marvel, and to a certain extent Tony too, had that overbred air which old Jim Marvel had always wanted and never achieved. Tony did not argue. He was willing enough, because he was tired. Even if he were forbidden to write to Judith, he could always think about her. In the middle of September, more than eight months ago, he sailed by the Queen Anne from Southampton, and on that night, the terrors began. Hargraves paused. The gas fire still hissed in the little dim study. You would have known that this was a house in which death had occurred, and occurred recently, by the look on the face of Hargraves' companion. He went on. The Queen Anne sailed at midnight. Tony saw her soaring up above the docks as high as the sky. He saw the long decks, white and shiny like shoeboxes, gleaming under skins of lights. He saw the black dots of passengers moving along them. He heard the click, rattle rush of winches as great cranes swung over the crowd on the docks, and he felt the queer, pleasurable, restless feeling which stirs the nerves at the beginning of an ocean voyage. At first, he was as excited as a schoolboy. Stephen Marvel and Judith Gates, Tony's fiancé, went down to Southampton with him. Afterwards, he recalled talking to Judith, holding her arm, piloting her through the rubbery-smelling passages of the ship to show her how fine it was. They went to Tony's cabin, where his luggage had been piled together with a basket of fruit. Everybody agreed this was a fine cabin. It was not until a few minutes before the all-ashore gong that the first pang of loneliness struck him. Stephen and Judith had already gone ashore, for all of them disliked these awkward last-minute leave-takings. They were standing on the docks, far below. By leaning over the rail of the ship, you could just see them. Judith's face was tiny, remote and smiling, infinitely loved. She was waving to him. Round him surged the crowd, Faces, hats, noise under naked lights, accentuating the break with home and the water that would widen between. Next, he heard the gong begin to bang, hollow, quivering, pulsing to loudness over the cry, all ashore that's going ashore, and dying away into the ship. He did not want to go. There was still plenty of time he could still gather up his luggage and get off. For a time, he stood by the rail, with the breeze from Southampton water in his face, such a notion was foolish. He would stay. With the last wave to Judith and Stephen, he drew himself determinedly away. He would be sensible. He'd go below and unpack his things. Feeling the unreality of that hollow night, he went down to his cabin on sea deck, and his luggage was not there. He started round the stuffy cabins with its neat curtains at the portholes, 
There had been a trunk and two suitcases, gaudily labeled, to say nothing of the basket of fruit. Now the cabin was empty. Tony ran upstairs again to the purser's office. The purser, a harassed man behind a kind of ticket-window desk, was just getting rid of a clamoring crowd. In the intervals of striking a handbell and calling orders, he caught Tony's eye. "'My luggage!' Tony said. "'That's all right, Mr. Marvel,' said the harassed official. "'It's been taken ashore, but you better hurry yourself!' Tony had here only a feeling of extreme stupidity. "'Take it ashore?' he said. "'But why? Who told you to send it ashore?' "'Why, you did!' said the purser, looking up suddenly from a sheet of names and figures. Tony only looked at him. "'You came here,' the purser went on, with sharply narrowing eyes, "'not ten minutes ago. You said you decided not to take the trip and asked for your luggage to be taken off. I told you that at this date we could not, of course, refund the—' oh, "'Get it back!' said Tony. His own voice sounded wrong. "'I couldn't have told you that. Get it back!' "'Just as you like, sir,' said the purser, smiting on the bell if there's time. Overhead, the hoarse blast of the whistle that mournfulest of all sounds at sea beat out against Southampton water. B-deck, between open doors, was cold and gusty. Now, Tony Marvel had not the slightest recollection of having spoken to the purser before. That was what struck him between the eyes like a blow and what for the moment almost drove him to run away from the Queen Anne before they should lift the gangplank. It was the nightmare again. One of the worst features of his nervous breakdown had been the conviction, coming in flashes at night, that he was not real any longer, that his body and his inner self had moved apart, the first walking or talking in everyday life like an articulate dummy while the brain remained in another place. It was as though he were dead and seeing his body move. Dead. To steady his wits, he tried to concentrate on familiar human things. Judith, for instance, he recalled Judith's hazel eyes, the soft line of her cheek as she turned her head, the paper cuffs she wore at the office. Judith, his fiance, his secretary, who would take care of things while he was away, whom he loved, and who was so maddeningly close even now. But he must not think of Judith. Instead, he pictured his brother Stephen and Johnny Cleaver and any other friends who occurred to him. He even thought of old Jim Marvel, who was dead. And so strong is the power of imaginative visualization, at that moment, in the breezy lounge room facing the purser's office, he thought he saw old Jim looking at him around the corner of a potted palm. All this, you understand, went through Tony's mind in the brief second while he heard the ship's whistle hoot out over his head. He made some excuse to the purser and went below. He was grateful for the chatter of noise for the people passing up and down below decks. None of them paid any attention to him, but at least they were there. But when he opened the door of his cabin, he stopped and stood very still in the doorway. The propellers had begun to churn. A throb, a heavy vibration, shook upwards through the ship. It made the tooth glass tinkle in the rack and sent a series of creaks through the bulkheads. The Queen Anne was moving. Tony Marvel took hold of the door as though that movement had been a lurch, and he stared at the bed across the cabin. On the white bedspread, where it had not been before, lay an automatic pistol. The gas fire had heated its asbestos pillars to glowing red. Again, there was a brief silence in the little study of the house in St. John's Wood. Hargraves, Sir Charles Hargraves, Assistant Commissioner of Police for the Criminal Investigation Department, leaned down and lowered the flame of the heater. Even the tone of his voice seemed to change when the gas ceased its loud hissing. "'Wait,' he said, lifting his hand. "'I don't want you to get the wrong impression. Don't think that the, that the fear, the, the slow approach of what was going to happen, pursued Tony all through his trip around the world. It didn't. That's the most curious part of the whole affair. Tony had told me that it was a brief, bad bout, lasting perhaps fifteen minutes in all, just before and just after the Queen Anne sailed. It was not alone the uncanny feeling that things had ceased to be real. It was a sensation of active malignancy, of hatred, of danger of what you like, surrounding him and pressing on him. He could feel it like a weak current from a battery. 
The five minutes after the ship had headed out to open sea, every such notion fell away from him. It was as though he had emerged out of an evil fog. That hardly seemed reasonable, even supposing that there are evil emanations or evil spirits. It's difficult to think that they are confined to one country, that their tentacles are broken by half a mile's distance, that they cannot cross water. Yet there it was. One moment he was standing there with the automatic pistol in his hand, the noise of the engines beating in his ears and a horrible impulse joggling his elbow to put the muzzle of the pistol into his mouth and… then snap! Something broke. It's the only way he can describe it. He stood upright, he felt like a man coming out of a fever, shaken and sweating, but back from behind the curtain into the real world again. He gulped deep breaths. He went to the porthole and opened it. From that time on, he says, he began to get well. How the automatic had got into his cabin, he did not know. He knew he must have brought it himself, in one of those blind flashes, but he could not remember. He stared at it with new eyes, a new feeling of the beauty and sweetness of life. He felt as though he had been reprieved from execution. You might have thought that he would have flung the pistol overboard in sheer fear of touching it, but he didn't. To him, it was part of a puzzle. He stared much at it, a Browning 38, a Belgian manufacturer, fully loaded. After the first few days, when he did keep it locked away out of sight in his trunk, he pondered over it. It represented the one piece of evidence he could carry back home with him, the one tangible reality in a nightmare. At the New York Customs shed, it seemed to excite no surprise. He carried it overland with him, Cleveland, Chicago, Salt Lake City, to San Francisco in a fog, and then down the kindled sea to Honolulu. In Yokohama, they were going to take it away from him, only a huge bribe retrieved it. Afterwards, he carried it on his person and was never searched. As the broken bones of his nerves knitted, as in the wash of the propellers, there was peace. It became a kind of mascot. It went with him through the blistering heat of the Indian Ocean, into the murky Red Sea to the Mediterranean, to Port Said, to Cairo in early winter, to Naples and Marseille and Gibraltar. It was tucked away in his hip pocket on the bitter cold night a little more than eight months after his departure when Tony Marvel, a he old man again, landed back at Southampton in the SS Chippenham Castle. It was snowing that night, you remember? The boat train roared through thickening snow. It was crowded and the heat would not work. Tony knew that there could be nobody at Southampton to meet him. His itinerary had been laid out in advance, and he had stuck to the bitter letter of his instructions about not writing even so much as a postcard. But he had altered the itinerary so as to take a ship that would get him home in time for Christmas. He'd burst in on them a week early. For eight months, he had lived in a void. In an hour or two, he'd be home. He'd see Judith again. In the dimly lighted compartment of the train, his fellow passengers were not talkative. The long voyage had squeezed their conversation dry. They almost hated each other. Even the snow roused only a flicker of enthusiasm. "'Real old-fashioned Christmas!' said one. "'Ha!' said another, appreciatively, scratching it with his fingernails at the frosted window. "'Damn cold, I call it!' snarled a third. "'Can't they ever make the heat work in these trains?' I'm damn well going to make a complaint. After that, with a sympathetic grunt or mutter, each retired behind his newspaper, a white blank wall which rustled occasionally and behind which they drank up news of home. In other words, Tony remembers that he thought then he was in England again. He was home. For himself, he only pretended to read. He leaned back in his seat, listening vaguely to the clackety roar of the wheels and the long blast of the whistle that was torn behind as the train gathered speed. He knew exactly what he would do. It would be barely ten o'clock when they reached Waterloo. He would jump into a cab and hurry home, to this house, for a wash and brush-up. Then he would pelt up to Judith's flat at Hampstead as hard as he could go. Yet this thought, which should have made him glow, left him curiously chilly around the heart. He fought the chill. He laughed at himself, Determinedly, he opened the newspaper, distracting himself, turning from page to page, running his eye down each column. 
Then he stopped. Something familiar caught his eye, some familiar name. It was an obscure item on a middle page. He was reading in this paper the news of his own death. Just that. Mr. Anthony Dean Marvel of Upper Avenue Road, St. John's Wood, an owner of Marvel Hotels Limited, was found shot dead last night in his bedroom at home. A bullet had penetrated up through the roof of the mouth into the brain, and a small caliber automatic was in his hand. The body was found by Mrs. Reach, Mr. Marvel's housekeeper, who… a suicide! And once again, as suddenly as it had left him aboard the ship, the grasp fell on him, shutting him off from the real world into the unreal. The compartment, as I told you, was very dimly lighted, so it was perhaps natural that he could only dimly see a blank wall of upheld newspapers facing him, as though there were no fellow passengers there, as though they had deserted him in a body, leaving only the screens of paper that jogged a little with the rush of the train. Yes, he was alone. He got up blindly, dragging open the door of the compartment to get out into the corridor. The confined space seemed to be choking him. Holding his own newspaper up high so as to catch the light from the compartment, he read the item again. There could be no possibility of a mistake. The account was too detailed. It told all about him, his past and present. His brother, Mr. Stephen Marvel, the eminent Harley Street surgeon, was hurriedly summoned. His fiancée, Miss Judith Gates. It's understood that in September, Mr. Marvel suffered a nervous breakdown from which even a long rest had not effected a cure. Tony looked at the date of the newspaper, afraid of what he might see. But it was the date of that day, the 23rd of December. From this account, it appeared that he had shot himself 48 hours before. And the gun was in his hip pocket now. Tony folded up the newspaper. The train moved under his feet with a dancing sway, jerking above the click of the wheels, and another thin blast of the whistle went by. It reminded him of the whistle aboard the Queen Anne. He glanced along the dusty corridor. It was empty, except for someone whom he supposed to be another passenger, leaning elbows on the rail past the windows and staring out at the flying snow. He remembers nothing else until the train reached Waterloo, but Something, an, an impression, a subconscious memory, registered in his mind about that passenger he had seen in the corridor. First, it had to do with the shape of the person's shoulders. Then Tony realized that this was because the person was wearing a great coat with an old-fashioned brown fur collar. He was jumping blindly out of the train at Waterloo when he remembered that old Jim Marvel always used to wear such a collar. After that, he seemed to see it everywhere. When he hurried up to the guard's van to claim his trunk and suitcases, the luggage ticket in his hand, he was in such a crowd that he could not move his arms, but he thought he felt brown fur press the back of his shoulders. The porter got him a taxi. He was a relief to see a London cab again, and a coughing London terminus, and hear the bump of the trunk as it went up under the strap and friendly voices again. He gave the address to the driver, tipped the porter, and jumped inside. Even so, the porter seemed to be holding open the door of the taxi longer than was necessary. "'Close it, man!' Tony found himself shouting. "'Close it quick!' "'Yes, sir,' said the porter, jumping back. The door slammed. Afterwards, the porter stood and stared after the taxi. Tony, glancing out the little back window, saw him still standing there. It was dark in the cab, and as close as though a photographer's black hood had been drawn over him. Tony could see little but he carefully felt with his hands all over the seat, all over the open space, and he found nothing. At this point in the story, Hargraves broke off for a moment or two. Our story, New Murders for Old, by Carter Dixon, will continue when Weird Darkness returns. You're listening to a Weird Darkness Darkives episode, where I reach back to share an episode with you from years past. If my voice sounds different in this episode, it's because the recordings are older, my presentation style was different, and my voice has naturally gotten lower over the years. For some of you, this will be a nice blast from the past. For others, it'll be new to you with stories you've not yet heard me tell. <laughs> 
My goal now is to bring you new episodes of Weird Darkness every Monday through Friday as best I can, and also post a Dark Archives episode, or Darkives episode, every day of the week as well. I hope you enjoy the new schedule. At this point in the story, Hargraves broke off for a moment or two. He'd been speaking with difficulty, not as though he expected to be doubted, but as though the right words were hard to find. His gloved fingers opened and closed on his knee. For the first time, his companion, Miss Judith Gates, interrupted him. Judith spoke from the shadow on the other side of the gas fire. Wait, she said, please. Yes, said Hargraves. This person who was following Tony. She spoke also with difficulty. You aren't telling me that it was, well, was... Was what? Dead, said Judith. I don't know who it was, answered Hargraves, looking at her steadily, except that it seemed to be somebody with a fur collar on his coat. I'm telling you Tony's story, which I believe. Judith's hand shaded her eyes. All the same she insisted, and her pleasant voice went high. Even supposing it was, I mean, even supposing it was the person you think, he of all people, living or dead, wouldn't have tried to put any evil influence around Tony. Old Jim loved Tony. He left Tony every penny he owned, and not a farthing to Stephen. He always told Tony he'd look after him. And so he did, said Hargraves. But, you see, Hargraves told her slowly, you still don't understand the source of the evil influence. Tony didn't himself. All he knew was that he was bowling along in a dark taxi through slippery, snowy streets, and whatever might be following him, good or bad, he couldn't endure it. Even so, everything might have ended well if the taxi driver had been careful, but he wasn't. That was the first snowfall of the year, and the driver miscalculated when they were only 200 yards from Upper Avenue Road, he tried to take a turn too fast. Tony felt the helpless swing of the skid, he saw the glass partition tilt, and a black tree trunk rush up, huge at them, until it exploded against the outer windscreen. They landed upright against the tree with a buckled wheel. "'I had to swerve,' the driver was crying. "'I had to! And an old jet with a fur collar walked smack out in front of me!' And so, you see, Tony had to walk home alone. He knew something was following him before he had taken half a dozen steps. Two hundred yards don't sound like a great distance. First right, first left, and you're home. But here it seemed to stretch out interminably, as such things do in dreams. He did not want to leave the taxi driver. The driver thought this was because Tony doubted his honesty about bringing the luggage on when the wheel was repaired, but it was not that. For the first part of the way, Tony walked rapidly. The other thing walked at an equal pace behind him. By the light of a tree lamp, Tony could see the wet fur collar on the coat, but nothing else. Afterwards, he increased his pace to what was almost a run, and though no difference could be seen in the gait of what was behind him, it was still there. Unlike you, Tony didn't wonder whether it might be good or evil. These nice differences don't occur to you when you're dealing with something that may be dead. All he knew was that he mustn't let it identify itself with him or he was done for. Then it began to gain on him, and he ran. The pavement was black, the snow dirty gray. He saw the familiar turning where the front gardens were built up above the low stone walls. He saw the street sign fastened to one of those corners, white lettering on black, and, in sudden, blind panic, he plunged for the steps that led up to his home. The house was dark. He got the cold keys out of his pocket, but the key ring slipped round in his fingers, like soap and bath water, and fell on the tiled floor of the vestibule. He groped after it in the dark, just as the thing turned in at the gate. In fact, Tony heard the gate creak. He found the keys, found the lock by a miracle, and opened the door. But he was too late because the other thing was already coming up the front steps. Tony says that at, at that close range, against a street lamp, the fur collar looked more wet and moth-eaten. That's all he can describe. 
He was in a dark hall with the door open. Even familiar things had fled his wits, and he could not remember the position of the light switch. The other person walked in. In his hip pocket, Tony remembered he still had the weapon he'd carried round the world. He fumbled under his overcoat to get the gun out of his pocket, but even that weak gesture was no good to him, for he dropped the gun on the carpet. Since the visitor was now within six feet of him, he did not stop. He bolted up the stairs. At the top of the stairs, he risked a short glance down. The other thing had stopped. In faint, bluish patches of light which came through the open front door, Tony could see that it was stooping down to pick up the automatic pistol from the carpet. Tony thinks, now, that he began to switch on lights in the upper hall. Also, he shouted something. He was standing before the door of his bedroom. He threw open his door, blundered in, and began to turn on more lamps. He had got two lamps lighted before he turned to look at the bed, which was occupied. The man on the bed did not, however, sit up at the coming noise or lights. A sheet covered him from head to feet, and even under the outline of the sheet you could trace the line of the wasted, sunken features. Tony Marvel then did what was perhaps the most courageous act of his life. He had to know. He walked across and turned down the upper edge of the sheet and looked down at his own face. A dead face turned sightlessly up from the bed. Shock? Yes. But more terror? No, for this dead man was real. He was flesh and blood, as Tony was flesh and blood. He looked exactly like Tony, but it was now no question of a real world and an unreal world. It was no question of going mad. This man was real, and that meant fraud and imposture. A voice from across the room said, "'So you're alive!' and Tony turned around to find his brother Stephen looking at him from the doorway. Stephen wore a red dressing gown, hastily pulled around him, and his hair was tussled. His face was one of collapse. "'I didn't mean to do it!' Stephen was crying out at him, even though Tony did not understand. He felt that the words were a confession of guilt. They were babbling words, words which made you pity the man who said them. "'I never really meant to have you killed aboard that ship,' said Stephen. "'It was all a joke, you know, uh, I wouldn't have hurt you, you know that, you know that, don't you? Listen. Now Stephen, as I said, was standing in the doorway, clutching his dressing gown round him. What made him look round towards the hall behind, quickly, Tony did not know. Perhaps he heard a sound behind him, perhaps he saw something out of the corner of his eye, but Stephen did look around, and he began to scream. Tony saw no more, for the lights in the hall went out. The fear was back on him again, and he could not move, for he saw a hand. It was only, so to speak, the flicker of a hand. This hand darted in from the darkness out in the hall. It caught hold of the knob on the bedroom door and closed the door. It turned a key on the outside, locking Tony into the room. It kept Stephen outside in the dark hall, and Stephen was still screaming. A good thing, too, that Tony had been locked in the room. That saved trouble with the police afterwards. The rest of the testimony comes from Mrs. Reach, the housekeeper. Her room was next door to Stephen's bedroom at the end of the upstairs hall. She was awakened by screams, by what seemed to be thrashing sounds and the noise of hard breathing. These sounds passed her door toward Stephen's room. Just as she was getting out of her bed and putting on a dressing gown, she heard Stephen's door close. Just as she set out into the hall, she heard for the second time in 48 hours the noise of a pistol shot. Now, Mrs. Reach will testify in a coroner's court that nobody left or could have left Stephen's room after the shot. She was looking at the door, though it was several minutes before she could screw up enough courage to open the door. When she did open it, all sounds had ceased. He'd been shot through the right temple at close range, presumably by himself, since the weapon was discovered in a tangle of stained bedclothing. There was nobody else in the room and all the windows were locked on the inside. The only other thing Mrs. Reach noticed was an unpleasant and intensely unpleasant smell of mildewed cloth and wet fur. Again, Hargraves paused. It seemed that he had come to the end of the story. An outsider might have thought, too, that he had emphasized these horrors too much, for the girl across from him kept her hands pressed against her eyes. But Hargraves knew his business. Well, 
he said gently. You see the explanation, don't you? Judith took her hands away from her eyes. Explanation? The natural explanation, repeated Hargraves, spacing his words. Tony Marvel is not going mad. He never had any brainstorms or blind flashes. He only thought he had. The whole thing was a cruel and murderous fake engineered by Stephen, and it went wrong. But if it had succeeded, Stephen Marvel would have committed a very nearly perfect murder. The relief he saw flash across Judith's face, the sudden dazed catching at hope, went to Hargrave's heart. But he did not show this. Let's go back eight months, he went on, and take it from the beginning. Now, Tony is a very wealthy young man. The distinguished Stephen, on the other hand, was swamped with debts and always on the thin edge of bankruptcy. If Tony were to die, Stephen, the next of kin, would inherit the whole estate. So Stephen decided that Tony had to die. But Stephen, a medical man, knew the risks of murder. No matter how cleverly you plan it, there is always some suspicion, and Stephen was bound to be suspected. He was unwilling to risk those prying detectives, those awkward questions, those damning post-mortem reports until, more than eight months ago, he suddenly saw he could destroy Tony without the smallest suspicion attaching to himself. In St. Jude's Hospital, where he did some charity work, Stephen had found a broken-down ex-schoolmaster named Rupert Hayes. Every man in this world, they say, has his exact double. Hayes was Tony's double to the slightest feature. He was, in fact, so uncannily like Tony that the very sight of him made Stephen flinch. Now, Hayes was dying of tuberculosis. He had, at most, not more than a year to live. He'd be eager to listen to any scheme which would allow him to spend the rest of his life in luxury and die of natural causes in a soft bed. To him, Stephen explained the trick. Tony should be ordered off, apparently, on a trip around the world. On the night he was to sail, Tony should be allowed to go aboard. Hayes should be waiting aboard that same ship with a gun in his pocket. After Stephen or any other friends had left the ship conveniently early, Hayes should entice Tony up to the dark boat deck. Then he was to shoot Tony through the head and drop the body overboard. Haven't you ever realized that a giant ocean liner just before it leaves port is the ideal place to commit a murder? Not a soul will remember you afterwards. The passengers notice nothing. They're too excited. The crew notice nothing. They're kept too busy. The confusion of the crowd is intense, and what happens to your victim after he goes overboard? He'll be sucked under and presently caught by the terrible propellers to make him unrecognizable. When a body is found, if it is found at all, it will be presumed to be some dock roisterer. Certainly, it will never be connected with the ocean liner because there will be nobody missing from the liner's passenger list. Missing from the passenger list? Of course not. Hayes, you see, was to go to the purser and order Tony's luggage to be sent ashore. He was to say he was canceling the trip and not going after all. After killing Tony, he was then to walk ashore as… The girl uttered an exclamation. Hargraves nodded. You see it now. He was to walk ashore as Tony. He was to say to his friends that he couldn't face the journey after all and everybody would be happy. But why not? The real Tony was within an ace of doing just that. Then Hayes, well coached, would simply settle down to play the part of Tony for the rest of his natural life. Mark that, his natural life. A year at most. He'd be too ill to attend to the business, of course. He wouldn't even see you as fiancé too often. If ever he made any bad slips, that, of course, would be his bad nerves. He would be allowed to develop lung trouble. At the end of the year, amid sorrowing friends, Stephen had planned brilliantly. Murder? What do you mean murder? Let the doctors examine as much as they like. Let the police ask what questions they like. Whatever steps are taken, Stephen Marvel is absolutely safe, for the poor devil in bed really has died a natural death. Only, well, it went wrong. Hayes wasn't cut out to be a murderer. I hadn't the favor of his acquaintance, but he must have been a decent sort. He promised to do this, but 
when it came to the actual fact, he couldn't force himself to kill Tony. Literally, physically, couldn't. He threw away his pistol and ran. On the other hand, once off the ship, he couldn't confess to Stephen that Tony was still alive, he couldn't give up that year of sweet luxury with all Tony's money at his disposal to soothe his aching lungs, so he pretended to Stephen that he had done the job, and Stephen danced for joy. But Hayes, as the months went on, did not dance. He knew Tony wasn't dead. He knew there would be a reckoning soon, and he couldn't let it end like that. A week before, he thought Tony was coming home after writing a letter to the police to explain everything, Hayes shot himself rather than face exposure. There was a silence. That, I think, Hargraves said quietly, explains everything about Tony. Judith Gates bit her lips. Her pretty face was working, and she could not control the twitching of her capable hands. For a moment, she seemed to be praying. Thank God, she murmured. I was afraid. Yes, said Hargraves. I know. But it still doesn't explain everything. It... Hargraves stopped her. I said, he pointed out, that it explains everything about Tony. That's all you need to worry about. Tony is free. You are free. As for Stephen Marvel's death, it was suicide. That's the official record. But that's absurd, cried Judith. I didn't like Stephen. I always knew he hated Tony, but he wasn't one to kill himself, even if he were exposed. Don't you see? You haven't explained the one real horror. I must know. I mean, I must know if you think what I think about it. Who was the man with the brown fur collar? Who followed Tony home that night? Who stuck close by him to keep the evil influence off of him? Who was his guardian? Who shot Stephen in revenge? Sir Charles Hargraves looked down at the sputtering gas fire. His face inscrutable, was wrinkled in sharp lines from mouth to nostril. His brain held many secrets. He was ready to lock away this one, once he knew that they understood each other. You tell me, he said. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. And please leave a rating and review of the show in the podcast app you listen from. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. Weirddarkness.com is also where you can find all of my social media, listen to audiobooks I've narrated, shop the Weird Darkness store, sign up for monthly contests, find other podcasts that I host, and find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. The fictional story New Murders for Old was written by Carter Dixon and can be found in the book Alfred Hitchcock Presents My Favorites in Suspense, which I have linked to in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Ah, Sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. And a final thought. Surround yourself with people whose eyes light up when they see you coming. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. I add to swerve, the driver was crying. I I add to swerve, the driver was crying. I add to. An old gent with a fur collar. An old gent with a fur collar walked smack. An old gent with a fur collar walked smack out in front of. And so you see, Tony. An old gent with a fur collar walked smart. And an old gent with a fur collar walked smack out in front of me.